Okay. Let's try this a third time. Instagram, it keeps kicking me off. I am so sorry. So, this is, of course, the first episode back is just a, a nutcase. So anyways, we're going to get uh, Tim on and it's going to be very exciting. Um, again, sorry if because it cut off. Um, if you do have a question that you want to submit, the bottom right hand corner of your screen, there is a question mark bubble. Please submit your questions there so that we can um, answer the questions that you want to submit. So we are going to get uh, Tim on here right now. Yeah, I know I should consider Facebook Live. There's a, I have a lot of trouble with uh, Instagram Live. Okay, hold on one second. We're gonna get Tim on here. Hey guys, thanks for joining. Okay, we're having difficulties right now. Tim, if you're listening, I'm going to send you one to your direct profile. Oh, hi. Hey, how are you? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Sorry I'm doing for the, Sorry for the technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome to welcome to my life. I hear that all the time. How are you? I'm doing well doing well just uh just hunkered down here in beautiful rhode island mm -hmm. and um but everything's going well but thank you so much for having me on i really appreciate it well thank you so much for um for saying yes um Absolutely. yeah your documentaries actually got me back into history so um, thank you for that well you know, <laughs> you know if, if if one person says that that's that's why we do them and and you know you've 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 definitely done some incredible things with for a person who got back into history and you know I love I love the things that you do and it's you know you have to educate a newer generation and a current generation and think about future generations so you're definitely doing it in a different way which I think that's great for history well, thank, and teaching history. thank you you're welcome <laughs> I know it's I I take definitely a different approach to uh, yeah. sharing history <laughs> Okay. No, you have to. I mean, you know, everyone thinks of history as being this dusty old book that you had in the in the seventh grade. And, yeah. you know, you find out with younger generations and, you know, they're so visual these days. So any way mm -hmm. you can present history and, you know, um, and, and deliver history, get them, get younger people interested in it, I think, you know, you have to be creative. And I think you definitely do that. And, and so many people who have been on your show do that. And, and, um, it's it's just amazing to see all the people in the community who are trying to keep that generation going and and the messages exactly. from that generation the lessons and 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 they're just you know I always I always kid around with with students who come in and I always say you know that generation left us a blueprint on how to be better people how to be more humble how to you know take pride in a lot of things how to work together and mm -hmm. um, it's important that you preserve that in your own way and I think so that's great. Exactly. I completely agree with you. Um, you know, it was, they are deemed the, the greatest generation and, you know, they went through a lot, um, yeah. <laughs> in regards to that. So it's, um, it's something we definitely need to take to heart and keep sharing and all that stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. absolutely. So, 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 let, so go ahead, fire away. Yeah. Let's get to the nitty gritty. I need to know, how did you get into history? Like, where where did it start? Because you are like so far like 
<laughs> you have the your museum, you have the foundation, you have all this stuff. So it started somewhere. Where did it start? It started when I was about six years old and I picked up a World War II book and started reading some stories about what was going on in North Africa. And then, you know, my, my parents are like, okay, here's a six-year-old kid who's, who's reading about Rommel and Montgomery and, and El Alamein and, and everything else. So it started then. I just was interested in, in how people were able to come through that time. And not only the soldiers, but, but the survivors, um, the witnesses. I mean, it's the whole, you know, the world as a whole was caught up into, in this. So it's, it's, it's how did people deal with it? How, how did they have the fortitude to, to come through that, you know, six years of, of you know, 39 to 45, but it really started all be before that. Um, mm -hmm. I, and I was just interested in the personal stories and some people were heroes and some people were cowards and some people survived and some people didn't survive. And it was such a random thing. There was so much luck involved about whether you survived World War II, even, you know, during the battle for London or the battle of the, you know, the battle of the Blitz and, and the Blitz. Um, the battle for England, I mean, random where the German bombs fell and who lived and who survived. So the randomness of the war itself um, is always something that I was interested in. I mean, you could have two guys in a foxhole and one guy taps the other guy and, you know, you've been in the foxhole with him for six hours and he still has a cigarette in his mouth, but he's dead. Mm -hmm. Sniper shot him in the head. So, you know, when the veterans came home, there was so much survivor's guilt with that generation. And that's why they hated being called heroes. They would always say the real heroes are buried in the cemeteries in Normandy or Margraten in, in Holland or Manila or the Punch Bowl in Hawaii. So they would actually get mad if you called them a hero because there was so much of that guilt because they knew they were lucky, you know, when they came home. So for me, I spent an additional 15 years as a journalist asking a lot of questions about sports, not about World War II, but it still kept me um, interested in, in, in that generation. And I always thought, you know, after I stopped doing what I was doing in TV news, this is the thing I wanted to do because I had so much respect for that generation and, and wanted to make sure that future generations knew these stories, not the strategy or the dates of battles and stuff, but mm -hmm. how someone came through it. And how they were able to climb point to hawk on D-Day with Germans, you know, dropping potato mashers on their heads. It takes a special person to do that. So that interested me a lot. So it was, it was very young. And I, I started collecting artifacts when I was probably around that age, too. And that's gotten pretty crazy, too. So, so you started collecting when you were six. Yeah, I think I got a couple of medals. I had a couple of uncles who were in the war. Mm -hmm. one, one worked on the Manhattan Project. And um, so with all the stuff coming out with Oppenheimer, yeah. it was interesting to revisit my uncle Jack's role um, as one of tens of thousands of scientists. There were probably about 200 to 250,000 scientists who actually worked on the bomb, but mm -hmm. only a certain upper level of those scientists knew it was an atomic bomb. The rest were figuring out formulas in all parts mm -hmm. of the country and stuff. So, um, so there are some direct ties that I had, but most of it was, again, just these incredible stories. Oh, wow. Okay, so you had an uncle that worked on the Manhattan Project. Yeah. What yeah. other... Um, uh, you had other uncles that were in World yeah. War Two. What are, what was that? One was a medic in Europe, and another one was on a destroyer destroyer escort in in the Pacific. And you know, we talk about um, how important it is for these men. He, my uncle Bob, just died probably about six months ago, and he was yeah. cremated. And his final one of his final requests was to have his urn brought back out into the Pacific Ocean and 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 left there and dropped there into the Pacific Ocean. And it's one of those things they never really talked about, but you see what an impact his time, you know, in World War II had on him that he would make that request to have uh, his urn dropped off, you know, Guadalcanal or, or, or some island out there. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Oh, that's, that is very intense. So were you able to make the journey out there to? Yeah, they're going to do it to? soon. They're going to do it soon, but we've done other films where we've had uh, followed veterans um, ashes brought back to the USS Arizona, for example, and, and have their ashes and urn brought back into turret number four there. So we, we see what places like that, uh, the impact it had on them, even if they didn't talk about it after the war. Yeah, it's, oh, that's, 
it's intense. It is very. Yeah. Intense. So let's let's talk about your documentaries for a little bit. So sure. um, <laughs> I have. So you have thirty four documentaries. We just finished number thirty four, and it was on Senator Bob Dole's World War II um, story. Yeah. So we flew, we flew out to Italy to go back to the exact spot um, in uh, outside of a village where he was wounded. And mm -hmm. um, it was quite quite an experience, but it's it's a pretty amazing story when you when you look at how it affected him physically and mentally too for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. So the documentaries of of yours that I've seen is um, my favorite is D Day at Pointe Hawk. Like that is one of my <laughs> yeah. all time favorite documentaries. Mine too. It's so good. Um, and then uh, Dick Winters Hang Tough, yep. Maggie's War. Um, uh, Oh, I can't think of them off the top of my head. I'm I'm totally spacing. We've had a crazy day at work, so <laughs> yeah, but, yeah. Um, uh, jo the Joe George story, mm. um, that one too as well. Yeah. Um, so how do you find these uh, topics to do your documentary about? I mean, sometimes you'll pick up a book like I did on James Magellus, and mm -hmm. then after I read the book. I said, I wonder, this is such an incredible story. I wonder if this guy's still alive and whether anyone has ever done a documentary on Maggie. Um, and no one had, and yes, he was alive. So I picked up the phone and got his phone number in Wisconsin. Uh, he was in actually Dallas at the time or outside of Dallas. And I said, would you be interested in going back to Europe to kind of relive some of the places you fought? Um, he was the most decorated officer in the history of the 82nd Airborne. He, he was awarded every award you can think of except the Medal of Honor, which he probably um, should have been awarded for his actions outside of Harrisbach in, in Belgium. So um, sometimes they fall into our lap. Um, mm -hmm. Just recently, we were in France and we went to Orador sur Glan, which was the village that was destroyed by the SS where they killed 643 locals. Um, and, and Charles de Gaulle um, decided to leave the village as it was on the day it was it was uh, burned to the ground, which was June 10th, 1944. So we hadn't planned on doing something at Orador, but all of a sudden we're there and we're like, we have to do something more on Orador. It wasn't our primary objective. So I think sometimes you just get really lucky and, mm -hmm. and that's the way it works. And other times you're you're reading a book and you um, you find a topic. Yeah. Luck, yeah, has, luck has a lot, <laughs> lot to do with everything in life. You know, it's pretty much, you know, that's the way it works. Yeah, you read something and you want to know more about it or more about this person's story and like all that stuff. And um, so just because I'm curious about this and yeah. because it's one of my favorite documentaries, um, how was going about filming the Point to Hawk documentary? You know, we, we go to Normandy every year, so we're in Normandy every single year for the anniversary. Mm -hmm. So early on, when we first started going back, I think around 2005, um, I made my first visit to Point to Hawk. And it's just one of those places where you say, oh, my God, you know, how, how did they do this? I mean, there was a lot that happened there that didn't go uh, as planned, which basically mm -hmm. describes D-Day itself. Really, nothing went as planned. Um, <laughs> some, some small things did, fortunately, but, but the bigger picture did not go according to the maps and everything else. So you, you say, how did these men, you know, why did they volunteer for the second Rangers? First of all, it's all volunteer. Mm -hmm. Then they went through all this commando training and, and then all of a sudden they're given their objective, which is to climb a hundred foot cliff. And at the time Eisenhower said it was the most important mission on D-Day. Um, that's what he said, you know, back then. But um, how, how did they do it? You know, how, how did these young men, why did they want to volunteer in the first place? Second place, what do you do when all your plans go out the window, which in their case, a lot of their plans went out the window and they had to improvise. So I think a lot of these stories, Sarah, teach you about life in general. Mm -hmm. And life in general is improvised when things don't go right. And I, and I think with younger students, when they come into our museum, we tell them, you know, you're going to face adversity. And if you watch Saving Private Ryan, you know, Captain John Miller, Tom Hanks's character, knew that the only way to survive was to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's something in life. Whatever adversity you face, the only option is to keep moving forward. And to me, there's no better example of the guys who fought in Europe and the Pacific and other theaters. Um, that's what they did. 
they move forward. And we try to tell the kids, you know, all of you are going to face adversity in your life. You know, think about what the people of World War II had to deal with and how their only path was to move forward. And in the end, it all worked out and it will be for you. But that's one of the lessons that generation left us. Yeah. And I mean, the, the kids that, you know, I, I see on your Instagram and, and social media, like you have kids who are 18, 19, 20 who come into the museum and that that is the age of those men right. who were you know in world war ii and it's it's just it's kind of insane to think about <laughs> you know it's yep. like an older person and looking and and seeing younger people you're like you're the people who uh your age is the people who yeah <laughs> fought and, the they, war. and they can't <laughs> believe it yeah. The kids can't believe it. And the kids are like, um, we interviewed this one guy, Ernie Carvesi. Ernie became a very good friend of ours. And he, he lived here up in, in Rhode Island. And he was an NCDU on D-Day, which means Naval Combat Demolition Unit. So he was in charge of going in in the first wave and removing all of Rommel's obstacles from the beach, blowing mm -hmm. them up. And he was the only survivor of his crew, you know, going in an inflatable boat because in 88, when Ernie jumped in the water, an 88 hit the boat and was full of TNT and the boat blew up. So Ernie, we brought him back and I said, well, Ernie, you know, after D-Day, you went to the Philippines. What did you do after the war? And he just shrugged and said, I went back to high school. And I'm like thinking to myself, he just said it so matter of factly, like, I landed in the first wave on D-Day. Then they sent me across the Pacific to go fight in the Philippines and see what was going on there. After the war, I went back and finished high school. And I'm like, I'm I was still sucking my thumb in high school. You know, <laughs> I mean, it, it's like you fought and landed on D-Day and spent, you know, three years in the war and then you went back and finished high school. I, I, yeah. So when we, when we tell 17 or 18 year olds that there's, they can't relate. And I think that's part of it. They can't relate to being put into that position. Yeah. And, and, um, so, yeah. And the, yeah. In this day and age, and um, how many kids who were anywhere from 13 to 17 who tried to get into, uh, you know, the armed forces during World War II because they felt it was their duty. And you're just like, you're 13 yeah. and you're wanting to join the Navy or the, the yeah. Marines, like all that stuff. And you're doing i can't remember um the gentleman's name but there was one guy who was i think he was in the navy and he was uh 13 and ended up getting he ended up getting injured and then they found out that he was his mom was looking for him and he ended up he was the youngest person to receive um like a, a silver star yeah. or a purple heart I and they, I, and they yeah. took it they took and it they, away from him his name, yes, he was yes, actually, and I, I, actually 12 and his name was calvin graham, calvin graham. and he took part oh, yes. yep and um he took part in the battle of guadalcanal and he did some very heroic things and then when they found out after his mom ratted him out and said you know he's 12 years old they threw him in the brig and the, the prisoners in the brig used to beat him up every day because he was a six foot um 200 pound kid from texas and they thought he was a deserter and he kept trying to tell them i'm in here because i'm 12 years old and they took away all his awards and he was finally given his family was finally given the awards back i believe in the 1970s it might have been during the ford or carter administration but mm -hmm. they finally said you know we're going to give his medals back but we did a film on a 14 year old who joined the 82nd airborne he was 14 years old and he was six foot from California and we did a documentary. Fortunately, he was still alive mm -hmm. and he was 14 and he jumped into Sicily when he was 15 and, you know, they kicked him out. He joined the Navy underage. They kicked him out. He finally joined the Merchant Marine and finished out the war as a paratrooper when he turned 18. And then he fought in Korea at the Battle of Chosen Reservoir and then did two tours in Vietnam as commander, as a Sergeant Major of Special Forces. I oh mean, my gosh. He had been in the military since he was 14 years old. And it's just incredible stories like that that we try to, to tell the younger people and preserve, so yeah. That is, oh my it, gosh, that is it's so, nuts. It's that nuts. is so insane. Yeah. And what's crazy is that a lot of people don't realize is that um, with the Korean War, it's, you know, the Forgotten War, um, just like World War One is also labeled that too. But a lot of World War II vets were in the Korean War mm -hmm. because it was literally five years after yeah. World War II ended. Yeah. And so you have all of these um, amazing vets.
veterans and leaders who, you know, went into Korea and stuff like that. And you just, you hear these stories and they're just like so insane. I can't believe he was in World War II, Korea and yeah. Vietnam. That is yeah. so insane. Yeah. Um, that is, um, that is a you, long you, conflict. Yeah. And they had to really kick him out of Vietnam. And then what he did when he got out of, when they kicked, finally said enough is enough, he joined what was called Air America. So he ended up working on helicopters and stuff and flying in helicopters. Air America at the time was basically a branch of the CIA and they were delivering medical supplies, but also weapons back in the Vietnam. So after he had done two tours, he still wanted to stay in country there and help out in some way. And he, they just buried him at Arlington last year. Oh. Uh, Jim Schmidt was his name. And um, to me, he's just a great American. I mean, he, you know, but there were some really upset people with him when he joined the army at 14, namely his mother. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, he, he was an incredible human being. And, and when you meet people like that, it makes you a better person, it really does. 100%. Yeah. I completely agree with that. So how did the International World War II Museum come about? <laughs> By my wife telling me to get all this stuff out of the basement. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we've been, we've been, I've been collecting for a long time uh -huh. and, and we spent a lot of time in Europe and we spent a lot of time in the Pacific and over the years I've made friends with a lot of people who are in the military um, artifact world mm -hmm. and a lot of the mm -hmm. times they'll see something and and we had good friends in france and other places they'll see a helmet or something and they'll say hey tim um you know we're going to sell this to you but we're going to give you a discount it would look great in the museum and we think your students would love it mm -hmm. and so people are always and then we get we get donations too. families will bring items in uniforms and helmets and stuff and and captured flags um other things but a lot of the things i i've you know come across while traveling and um on Guadalcanal or, um, you know, in, in Europe. Um, but yeah, it's, it's really, it's really become an amazing place. And, 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 and unfortunately world war II isn't really taught in schools anymore, especially in, in public schools. So mm -hmm. a lot of the students who come into the museum, let's say they're in ninth grade or 10th grade, this is really their only, um, relatable experience to being taught anything about world war II. And the thing that always amazes me is we've had probably about 4,000 kids through the museum since we opened five years ago. And there has not been one kid who sat in the corner on their phone disinterested in what they saw. So that mm -hmm. tells me that if you're willing as a teacher to engage them about the Holocaust, to uh, about D-Day or Iwo Jima or the atomic bombs or whatever, they're interested. But yeah. unfortunately, in the United States, history is always the first thing that gets cut in schools. They always start with history and then they move on to arts and maybe sports, something like that. Mm -hmm. But that's not the way it is in Europe. You're, in Europe, history is such an important part of their culture, their daily conversations and in their schools that um, I think it makes them a little bit more well-rounded in, in terms of how they deal with things. If they see a threat developing before it gets to that level of you know, a Holocaust or gets to the level of genocide or gets to the level of one country um, you know, invading another, like Russia and Ukraine. You know, yeah. people always are relating that back to World War II mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. in modern society that shouldn't be happening. But there are always those references of of mm -hmm. comparing now to then. And I think after September 11th, people said, "I can't believe this happened." And and I'm over in the corner, kind of raising my hand, saying, "Well, um, if you want to look at another." instance where airplanes you know attack the united states or united states territory unannounced we can talk about pearl harbor mm -hmm. like 9 11 we had our guard down at that time in 1941 so the lessons uh, history rhymes it, it may not repeat itself but it certainly rhymes it certainly rhymes and and people look at history too and they're like that happened in the past mm -hmm. they don't they never think it can happen in the present even Always though we've, we, we even though we've lived through it like we we lived through 9 11. i remember 9 11 like it was yesterday i know exactly what i was doing yep. where i was like and everything um and you know it's it's kind of surreal with the the war in ukraine you're mm -hmm. seeing this this kind of like you always see pictures and footage of world war ii and and those battles and you're looking at the war in ukraine with russia and you're like these are like hauntingly like similar 
photos mm -hmm. and, and, and stuff like that. And you never think that you're going to live through that type of thing. And so I think that is a huge thing for people. They don't really realize what they're living through, but yeah. why do you, why, why do you think that, um, our school system is not teaching world war II history? I think when I was, when I was in high school, this was a long time ago, um, I, I think I learned about World War II in sophomore year of high school, so 10th grade. Mm -hmm. But I don't, I don't think it was, like, that big of a, a thing. I think I feel like it was really rushed. Like, yes. we're, we're, like, we're going from this point right. to this point. Right. So um, why, why do you think that schools are not, like, teaching that? Is it just because, like, the curriculum, the, the budget? Yeah, it's mostly the curriculum. Type of thing? Yeah. There, there are, when I was in, when I was in middle school, we spent a week on World War II. Mm -hmm. So now my daughter spent three weeks on the American Revolution and about three days on World War II. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, okay, so you're spending three weeks on the revolution. I get it's the birth of our company, our, our country and, and everything else. I understand that. But you have actual World War II veterans in the community. You can come into your school and talk. I mean, we can't have George Washington come in and, and, and talk at the local high school, you know, unless you want to yeah. dig him up. Let, let's be honest, unless you want to dig them up and bring his bones in and make his teeth chatter. We have World War II veterans who can talk about history and, and keeping an eye on things so they don't spiral out of control. Mm -hmm. um, the most anti-war people you'll ever meet are those who have fought in wars, and especially World War II. You know, mm -hmm. you, you don't, the rah-rah guys are the guys who really never saw combat and might maybe flew a desk in Washington. And they're like, go get them, go get them, go do this and everything. And the World War II veterans are like diplomacy first. Mm -hmm. I saw my best friend die in the war. I don't want to see that happen to another young person. So, yeah. you know, the, those people who have seen more, and I've not, I was never in the military. I've never seen more except on television. Mm -hmm. And um, I never covered a war, did anything like that. But when you talk to these World War II veterans, they are the, the people who are advocates of making sure we don't repeat the mistakes of the past. And I think part of that is you need to teach the generation a younger generation about how those mistakes happened, how Hitler came to power, and 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 how you know Tojo and the army took over Japan and 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 you know things like that. So you need to be able to make them aware of the signs before it ever becomes a problem again. Mm -hmm. but that still didn't stop what's happening in in Russia and Ukraine. Yeah. So, but but that's that that's that part of the world, but. It's still it's still important to let them know that these things can happen again, and you always have to be on guard and observant to not let them get to the point where there are, you know, six million Jews who are killed by mm -hmm. a raving lunatic. Yeah. You know, and and don't tell me you didn't know about it, and and you can say that I was never a Nazi, and 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 you know we we travel a lot, and and we hear a lot of Holocaust survivors, you know, talk about at the end of the war that nobody was ever a Nazi and no one ever voted for Hitler or supported Hitler and all these other things. So I just think these stories resonate because they give us an opportunity to look into our own situations, not only individually, but globally and say, that's going to be a problem there. Let's nip that in the bud. That's going to be a problem over there. Let's try and solve that before it becomes a war. Mm -hmm. Sometimes wars just happen. And there's nothing you can do. But I, I know if the next global war happens, you and I are not going to be on Instagram talking to each other. So, no, you know, no, we're going to be, not. yeah, no, not, not for the foreseeable future after that. But, you know, I just think history is, is, is important in a lot of areas. And um, I wish American schools, um, public schools especially, would invest a little bit more time. But there's a lot of pressure on the teachers for the math and the sciences. Mm -hmm. And you have to get the physical education in there. And you gotta get some kind of music or language and things like that. So what, what you know, what's old and dusty? Well, history is old and dusty. Yeah. And I, and, but, but it's not really, it depends how you present it. Mm -hmm. So it's unfortunate that here in the States that it doesn't have more of a role in our curriculum. Yeah. When how I got into history was was eighth grade. Um, we learned about the Civil War, and we actually played out the Civil War uh, in class. And it was actually like a it was like a, a month and a half long. Um, I was we split the class in half, and I was designated as Ulysses Grant. <laughs> for you and so, you're on the so winning we, side you're yeah. on the winning side that's good so, so we we played out the timeline of 
the Civil War. And then also um, we ended up watching the movie Glory, which yeah. at the time I was in the Matthew Broderick fan club. Yeah. And so it just made it like 10 times more epic. I was seeing, yeah. <laughs> seeing him play yeah. shot. But um, in middle school, I had like, you know, like a month and a half of Civil War history. And so, um, but I don't know if if that, that's still you know it's that that was a very long time ago but um yeah. shorter so, than me but, trust me but i don't know like what the curriculum is anymore but i see these videos on like a uh, tiktok and youtube and people are asking like who was the first president and yeah. or this this one guy he walks around the mic and he goes who was the first president like you know and just asks all these things and people just don't know and it's just like kind of kind of weird like i I don't see why I don't see why history is such a bad thing in schools. I don't see because it no. it relates it relates a lot to modern day. Yeah. Um, even if it's if it's not exactly the same mm -hmm. thing, but you can take certain certain things from the past and and put it in the present and be like, this is what happened in the past, and this is what's going on right now. So like, yeah. you guys got to see like this similarities. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, we, we wrestle with that every day. And, and I think you have to use technology. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of great people out there doing a lot of, you know, we, we do a lot of virtual reality. So after we do a regular documentary, documentary film, we hire a crew out of New York, like at, at uh, in Normandy or, or Bastogne. Um, and they come in and we're doing virtual reality technology. Mm -hmm. So students will come in, students will come in and they'll put a VR headset on and we'll have a 360 degree view of um, Omaha Beach today. And you'll be looking, you're, basically you're standing in the English Channel and um, the kids are always like, wow. And then we bring in the voices of the veterans who were there. And mm -hmm. so, and then over on the right, you're seeing the actual archival footage of June 6, 1944. So it's all how you deliver the message. Yeah. Kids, kids aren't gonna read books anymore. They're gonna want their information about World War II on, on their phone or on their computer. Exactly. Yeah. Which is, which is why like social media has become such like a, a huge thing and like con you know, history content creators like, like me and JD and uh, from the history underground and Chris and like, uh, you know, all these people, um, because now we live in a world with cell phones and yeah. internet and that's how we do things. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and how many, how many people give me grief because I don't have a Kindle? I can't do a Kindle. I need a real oh, freaking book. I know. I'm, I know. I'm sorry. I'm I, I need. I need the paper. I, I need know. That. The Kindles. I'm just like I go cross-eyed, and I'm just like this is so ridiculous. I, I don't know. need to. I don't need to stare at another screen. I stare at three of them at work. Exactly. You're, you're there's, on there's, Instagram. There's a, sense, <laughs> there's a sense of comfort comfort with a book. So it um, is. It's, it's, it's but, very like I don't know, like homey or like yeah. um, or special, I guess. Yeah. to say the least. There, yeah, there, there are but, so many great people who are presenting history in different ways. Not only you guys, but you know, I really love the then and now photos that a lot of people do. Um, oh yes, on mm -hmm. on Facebook and everything. You're you're showing um, the church in Colville sur Mer on June 6, 1944, and then and then today. And I think that that is that's just genius stuff. We we did a whole film of then and now. It was about the first marine division in the pacific and we shot all video from today but also had video from then so it was a very then and now and it just intrigued me it it, it gives you a sense of place both today and then so it's not all just yeah archival, it's not all just archival video and stuff mm -hmm. but there's people who do the then and now i'm always always clicking on that stuff that's clickbait for me so it's, when I see that it's, it's just yeah cool. It's it's amazing. D Day history does yeah. it. Sander VK history does it. History yeah. in your hand does it. And it's and it's crazy to like actually see those photos because you're like, you know, we were in a world war, bombs, like destruction and all that stuff. And you see these buildings that are still yeah. intact, and you're like, yeah. this is the exact spot, yeah. like where this happened. Yeah. And this farmhouse is still here. Yeah. And this and the bullet road, holes are still here. Yeah, I know. It's absolutely insane. Yeah. And like, I'm I am not gonna lie, I'm very jealous of the people who live in Europe who can go do that. Because yeah. obviously, I'm in Oregon, we yeah. don't have anything like yeah. that. Here. Yeah. The, the one thing that happened in Oregon in World War II was at Fort Stevens and a Japanese sub uh, was along the Columbia River and they 
shot off a torpedo at Fort Stevens and it ended up taking out the, the baseball field sign. Yeah. <laughs> and that was like the, the one thing in Oregon and Fort Stevens was very important because that's where the uh, Pacific Ocean and the Columbia River yep. meet. Yep. And um, yeah, Oregon is very not. Well, actually, something, <laughs> some, something very tragic did happen in Oregon from World War II. Um, the Japanese used to have these, what they were called balloon bombs. And what they mm -hmm. would do is they would pack, they would pack these bombs in these balloons and send them on the, the, the jet stream from Japan. And one did land in Oregon. And I believe it, it, uh, oh. it, it killed like three or four Great people. people. It, was a, yeah. it was a family, it was a family. I think they were out for a picnic or they were out somewhere. But when you think about, you know, a, a, a balloon that was launched from mainland Japan that drifted across mm -hmm. the Pacific and ended up killing three or four people in the forest in Oregon. I mean, that's what the intention was, some random thing, but that did happen in Oregon. Yeah, I think that was in Klamath Falls. Yeah, I, I believe that, so. Yeah, um, yeah, it just, I, it just, it's super weird. And also we, um, in Oregon, I just found out, so there is, um, we are opening a, the Oregon Military Museum here in Oregon. Um, it's going to be the first like really good military museum. They're still right. getting trying to get funding. It's at um, Camp Withycombe, um, which is the air uh, the Army National Guard camp in Clackamas, Oregon. But right. um, they were talking about uh, that whole thing. But then also, I was talking to the director, and sh he said that we had a bunch of uh pow camps here in oregon mm, yeah Ger german pow yeah. camps so they said they sent them from germany and or oh, yeah. and all over europe yep. to oregon mm -hmm. and so that's a, another rabbit hole that i'm gonna go on because yeah. i was like i've never heard of that like oh, in yeah. oregon it's it's oregon's like the most random state <laughs> like, well they, they had po they had pow camps in iowa and there was one here in Rhode Island that was about 15 minutes from my house. And um, the one in Iowa I was reading about was a funny story that, that one day, these weren't SS guys, okay? They, they kept the fanatical Nazis somewhere else. These mm -hmm. were, were Wehrmacht, these were normal army guys who they were trying to denazify, but they weren't the hardcore SS guys who, you yeah. know, you couldn't, you couldn't do that to. Um, one, some Oregon people um, left their house one day and went, went down to a local bar and there were three guys with POW uniforms sitting at the bar drinking beers. And they just walked out of the German POW camp there in Iowa and uh, and gone down to the local bar and they had their POW, you know, on their, on their back and everything. And they're sitting in a local bar. And, and the locals, sometimes um, these guys would even stay after the war and end up marrying local girls mm -hmm. and, and everything. Mm -hmm. But I'm not surprised that Oregon had a camp, not at all. I mean, it's sporadically, they popped up all over the country. So. Yeah, it was. I mean, I was actually pretty shocked. Um, I mean, again, I I have just gotten back into history, and I, and I'm learning so much stuff, which is one of the reasons I do my pages. Is it, my page is that I want to share what I learn, yeah. um, and also what I already know. Um, but when I found out that there was a a POW camp here, like it was yeah. a huge camp, and like it's just it's it's insane because like, we're you know. we're a very <laughs> We're Oregon. We're a very uh, well. Back then, we probably weren't as. Never mind. I'm not going to get into politics. That's <laughs> no, no, it's, it, no, it, no. We don't want to go down that. We don't want to go down no, that no, route. No, no, but, no. but no, I. It's just. It's funny. Um, and there's probably somebody who's written a book about the POW camp there and in yeah. your local area. And because so, there's always one or two people who just dive into it, and all of a sudden mm -hmm. they're like, they have the names of all the POWs there who are there. You know, did they write? Um, they allowed some of these camps to do write their own newspapers that they would circulate among among the um, the prisoners and stuff. And again. And they were trying to denazify them and mm -hmm. um so they gave them more more leeway than you would um you know any anybody else who wasn't you know deemed you know ss or somebody like that so sometimes these guys would would end up wandering in the community and make friends with the people in the community and again it it just personalizes them as human beings not just as you know not every german who fought was a nazi so. yeah and, and that's what a lot of people think that every German was a Nazi and that's no. not that that's not it and so mm -hmm. trying to explain that to, to somebody nowadays and they're like every 
German was a Nazi, but that's not it. There were there were German soldiers who were fighting for their country, not for yeah. Hitler, and um, who didn't agree with Hitler and like all this other stuff. And it just um, it's it's a weird thing to try to explain to people. Yeah, that's a hard right? argument to have. You know, that's a hard not. You know, and they're like, give me examples, and I'm like, well, I, I always say, well, Rommel wasn't a Nazi. Or when Rommel never joined the Nazi party, you know, we did a whole film mm -hmm. on Rommel, and and one of the reasons Rommel was 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 forced to commit suicide, they they implicated him in the in the in the plot to kill Hitler. But the real reason um, that a lot of historians say is, you know, Rommel was so outspoken in front of Hitler that Hitler didn't like that, and Rommel was the only German German general who would tell Hitler like on June seventh or June fifteenth, you know, hey, I think we better surrender to the West. This is not going to end well for mm -hmm. the people of Germany. And, and nobody talked back to Hitler. So, I mean, you know, their most famous general, Rommel, um, was not a Nazi. And people are like, he's a Nazi. He, he fought for the Nazis. I know he never joined the Nazi party. He hated Hitler for the most part in the last you know, few years of their relationship. Mm -hmm. But he was, never, he was never a Nazi. He was like Patton. You know, he was a general who was told to go out and do this and do this and do this. And that's what he did. Yeah, he was. <laughs> And that's the thing I I always joke about the 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 love story of of Patton and <laughs> and Rommel because they had, they were two guys they were like the same exact person but on different sides yeah. and their arrogance and, and their tactics and like all that stuff was like like you can see why they had that dynamic of of everything especially in Africa and stuff like that and it's just like yeah um it's i don't know it's an, it, when you talk about rommel and actually you saying that i never actually really thought about it that way um with rommel not being a nazi and the way that he spoke back to hitler and the way that his his death him and his family's death that occurred um you have somebody who just didn't want to be told um the correct thing and was in denial and delusion and uh coked up messed up and like everything else and so the edibles um, it was the edibles it was the edibles <laughs> no i i just think it's interesting you know rommel rommel was was highly regarded by the british and the americans and um eisenhower admired him for his tactics um he did not unfairly treat prisoners um mm -hmm. a lot of a lot of stories about that um, thought Hitler was pretty much an idiot when it came to strategy. You know, Hitler, yeah. Rommel was against the, the invasion of the Soviet Union. He, you know, the other generals were against it too, but Rommel was one of those who spoke up against it, you know, after it had happened. And so it's interesting, you know, to find out there are these sub stories in war. Um, so, you know, that's another part that we were, we, we interviewed Rommel's son, Manfred, for the film. And Man Manfred was the mayor of Stuttgart, Germany for about 22, 23 oh. years. And he had the perspective, yeah, he had the perspective of being home when his dad was told about D-Day. So he's back in Germany, in Herlingen, Germany, and watching his dad pick up the phone and hearing from the folks in Normandy that the invasion's begun and Rommel mm -hmm. is in Germany. In Germany. And yeah. then was also home also home when his dad was taken away to, to commit forced suicide. So he talked a lot about that. And... Um, and and the respect that his father had for the Americans and the British, and it was they nicknamed the British nicknamed him the Desert Fox. I mean, they were mm -hmm. they they thought he was a great strategist and was was fighting the war um, in the way that a, a war should have been fought. And uh, yeah, observing the Geneva Convention, not like what was going out in the Pacific, but um, so yeah. I mean, I've read a lot about Rommel. He's just a really deep, um, interesting person to study because of the dynamics at play at the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. He's um, very, very tact. He's a very tactical guy. Yeah, um, he was he was there for war. He was there to battle and win. It wasn't anything political. No. And I think and, and, and that's also the same thing with Patton, too. Like he was he was there to, you know, just get these guys do, you know, fight tactics and like all that stuff and i think that's why like that dynamic was so like in intriguing but also like that's why people did not like them that much because yeah. they're like they're like dude this is what we need to do um but you're sitting here you know talking in the back of my head 
said politics and all this other stuff. And so Patton didn't just, like politics. Patton would not have hated made it a politician, you know. So, oh, no. so for him, for him. <laughs> For him, it was give me the orders and let me run across France and get into the Ruhr po pocket or get into Germany and let me do what I do. And you, Roosevelt, and you, Eisenhower, because you have to play the fence for everybody. Just leave me alone and let me go out and do what I have always done. You know, yeah. early on, early on, and and uh, you know he he's just a great tactician. He's one of those guys who's going to motivate his men whether they like it or not. So he was a soldier. He was a general's general, and 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 Rommel was like that as well. And and both didn't like the political game. None of them. Patton didn't like politics at all, and Rommel did not like politics at all. They just wanted to be soldiers and be given mm -hmm. their orders and carry their orders out. And so you de you de definitely have to respect that. So. Yeah, my my opa was in the Fourth Armor Division, and he was part of Patton's Third Army. And they were their one of their slogans was "The Beaches to Bavaria." Yeah, and how and how fast they trekked through Europe yeah. is absolutely insane. I have like the whole map and like the dates and like all yeah. that stuff from my opa, and it it just like you know you have, have Patton and Rommel were soldier soldiers. They weren't like you know, cake eaters or anything like that. Mm. So it's just um, they didn't play, play the political game very well, and no. they're often are often called into the principal's office because you know <laughs> they didn't play the political they game. Play by the they, rules. Yeah. They didn't they didn't play by the rules? No, they played by how they were taught and how they had fought in the First World War mm -hmm. and and their you know whether whether they were at West Point or wherever you know they were they they were smart strategic. Um, ambitious, sure, mm -hmm. um, but they were brilliant. And Montgomery yeah. was Montgomery was brilliant in many ways too, especially early in the war in North Africa. I mean, you have mm -hmm. to give all credit to Montgomery, you know, for um, you know for 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 getting the the Germans and Rommel on the run in North Africa, you know, before um, you know we landed there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you look at strategic minds, and they're they're just about training and and. Um, not getting involved in the in the politics of who's who's going to get what part of the world when the war is over. Yeah. Do you think Montgomery gets a lot more hate than he should? Uh, I feel like um, he does. Or, or I do think you, Mon you know what? It's really interesting with Montgomery. The you know, the, and it's been mentioned in movies and everything, and and they said that the British needed a hero too. Mm -hmm. And there's no question that Montgomery, early in the war in North Africa, saved the British. He was also a key planner for D-Day and saw mm -hmm. things yeah. that. that needed to be corrected on the original plans and eisenhower deferred to montgomery for that yes montgomery should have taken Caen, you know much uh, shorter before he did i mean that was you know he was supposed to be in Caen on d-day he wasn't um it wasn't for a long time um till till they took Caen. but um you know i think after after d-day his stock started to slide and he became more of a pain in the butt i think to eisenhower um <laughs> but early in the war you know mm -hmm. um he was certainly you know carrying his load um across north africa and especially intellectually looking over the d-day plans and saying you need another division here mm -hmm. and you know the airborne needs to go here and and so strategically i think he was he was very smart socially he was a total misfit so he did not know how to relate to others. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a lot of that is his awkwardness. He, he was a very awkward leader, um, never bit his tongue. We all have family members like that, um, you know, around the Thanksgiving table and stuff. You know, Uncle Lou's had a little too much, but we know he has no filter. So he's going to tell you exactly why your plan's going to fail, why you should yeah. marry that girl or why, you know, <laughs> why you got to get that earring out, young man. Um, yeah. but, that, but that's the way Montgomery was. And, and I read one book and it's interesting. One one, one author claimed that Montgomery had Asperger's syndrome, that, which is a form of just, autism. I was just going to ask that if that if what you think about that because I yeah just I, read I, that, I think I he just did. read that like a month ago. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he did i think he had a form of it i don't think it was overly severe but but with asperger's you don't have a filter and mm -hmm. socially it's harder for you to connect to other people yeah. but a lot of these young people or even older people with asperger's are totally brilliant so when i read that quote in the book from this historian that maybe he had asperger's i'm like duh you know I know people who have Asperger's, and those are their characteristics. Yeah. They're brilliant, yeah. and they're and you give them a job to do that they're Super focused smart. on. It, it's like, mm -hmm. oh my god! But socially, a little bit awkward. Don't relate to other people as much. So you know, 
I won't ever know for sure, but it struck me as really interesting that that came out of one, you know, historian's book. Yeah, I, I, I read that um, about like a month and a half ago that they, um, I think it was um, the amateur historian on Instagram, he, he posted something about um, uh, him being on, like having Asperger's. Mm -hmm. and, and back then that wasn't like you know we didn't have a diagnosis for that or a no. for that or or, no. or knew about that no. it's like um uh down syndrome like back in the 40s like nobody knew they they called <laughs> this was so insane when i learned this like uh they called people with down syndrome mongols mm. um and uh, and something else. It was very derogatory nowadays. Mm -hmm. But back then, they didn't know, like you know, that was just how the vocabulary was. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, that would that would maybe make sense that would explain for, some things to me. It, it would. It would um, with the way that he Montgomery like presented himself and and did a lot of things. But also, I mean, I don't know if we'll officially ever know. No, like, no. I mean, he was definitely he was definitely an egomaniac, and I think he definitely wanted to be in control. And and we've seen yeah. through documentaries and feature films that he and Patton were always, you know, who's going to get to Messina first, and 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 everything else. They were always very competitive with each other mm -hmm. and everything. And they both had super big egos. There's no question about that. that oh yeah. Them, you know, one of them wanted to 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 win. You know, be credited with with leading that final charge of the war to win it mm -hmm. in Europe. And, um, so, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting, there are so many different personalities during the war that I find that part really interesting. And one of my favorites is Eisenhower. And it's not only because he was in charge on D-Day, it's because he was the perfect manager. He kept the allies together. He had to deal with de Gaulle. That was not easy. He had to deal with Churchill. He had to deal mm -hmm. with Patton. He had to deal with Roosevelt. He had to deal with Marshall. He had to deal with, you know, Montgomery and and Omar Bradley, who was a great great soldier, but to me, mm -hmm. World War we don't win World War II without Eisenhower being that perfect manager of personalities and expectations, mm -hmm. and he was the only one who could keep that coalition together, and that's why yeah. I find fascinating and why he was such a great and underrated president. So, you know, which is so crazy that he was such he was such a great leader in World War II and tacticianer and keeping morale and just keeping everything in line and then he was just kind of like when he became president it, people were just kind of like eh. like eh, you're okay you know well, and you're like you know, have got, you looked got, at yeah. his, you know have you looked at his past have you looked at who this person was and like yeah, where he got him. today like it's just it's insane like, well it's just, if he could bring republicans and democrats into a room and get things done which you can't do today he was the perfect manager if you can bring de gaulle and churchill or you know george marshall and churchill into a room and get something done mm -hmm. that's what he did during mm -hmm. the war so you know he was like one of the real last you know, get them together in a room. Let's work this out from, you know, Republicans will get something out of this. The Democrats will get something out of this because yeah. he had all that experience during the war mm -hmm. saying the French are going to get something out of this. The British are going to get something out of this. So, you know, he got us out of Korea. He built the interstate highway system. He oversaw mm -hmm. that. It was a peaceful time in America leading up to Vietnam. Um, but Ike's one of my favorite presidents, and um, for for those reasons, I've got presidents I I love who are Republican and re, and and who are Democrat, and I love them because of their leadership capabilities and how they saw that we get much more done together than we ever ever will divided, and that's what's yeah. going on. Right? Today we can't talk to each other, we can't be a Democrat, we can't be a Republican. No, you can't. All of a sudden we're you can't. All of a sudden, we're, we're adversaries. You're, and you're one extreme or the other. And you can't exactly. Be, There's no middle anymore. Thinking. No, and and the thing is, there is a middle. I'm the middle. Like I am. I don't talk politics, but like it's just you can't. You can't. You're either society will do you as one extreme or another extreme. You can't like, which yep. is super silly. Um, because people can think for themselves and do their own research and yep. all that stuff. But do you think, um, do you think um, Ike was like a really huge get together for the Potsdam conference with everybody? I'm sorry, like, you, do you, you broke up. The, the Potsdam conference? 
Okay. Right, but right before the atomic bomb, do you think Ike is the one that kind of like really got everybody on all sides together? Well, I think you know, the decision had been made that the that the Russians were going to get Berlin and go into Berlin, mm -hmm. and I think you know, that's probably the biggest decision. As much as Americans wanted um, wanted to go in and, and finish the job. I think Eisenhower, uh, and, and this is something I respect him for, recognized that the Russians had had suffered the most during during the war. So mm -hmm. you know they have 28 million people dead, you know, 11 million soldiers, and the rest are civilians. Their their country was raped and, and pillaged and scorched earth and everything else. So I think Eisenhower recognized that he didn't want any more Americans to die, and and I think you know around that time. Um, the decision was made, and I and I think now you're starting to talk, talk post-war, and what the world is going to look like, and and were there mistakes made? Yeah, there were, of course, but, um, you know, I, I I think that coalition was going to break apart at the end of the war after the conference anyway, and um, so, you know, the, the, they were they were necessary um, reliances and relationships that weren't mm -hmm. going to last weren't going to last after after the war. Yeah, which is why we had Korea. Which we had the Cold War and everything else. Yeah. But you know, I'm just I'm just a documentary filmmaker, and I think you know there's so many great authors that I love to read who break this stuff down much more than I I could ever do it. You know, and I and and I know a lot of your audience loves to read, and you know that's why I like the Marcus Brothertons and the Alex Kershaws and the John McManuses. You know, I mean they break all this stuff down so well that and it flows you know and what we do is totally different than what they do mm -hmm. but man oh man do i love to read alex kershaw and and you know cornelius ryan and mm -hmm. you know all all the guys who've written before um you know even the authors today and, and one of the things about world war ii is um you go to any bookstore and there are new books coming out you know uh, there's yeah. that and that yeah. There's an Adam Makos book, uh, you know, yeah. there's, there's, it, there, it's always the content. So there's still an interest from the public in World War II. Mm -hmm. and, and why is that? Let me ask you a question. Why do you think there's still an interest in World War II with the public today, despite it happening, you know, 80 plus years ago? So I think one of the things, so I'm, so I'm 35, so I'm going to speak for, for my generation. Um, I think because a lot of us had a grandparent or a uncle or somebody who fought in World War II, just like my opa. My opa was in the 4th Armored Division. He was a staff sergeant. He has a Purple Heart. He's uh, just an awesome, awesome guy. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm so sorry. That's okay. Um, but what I think actually what happens in movies is I think that Okay, and I know Freddie's gonna flip when I say this. Don't listen to Freddie. He's feel, not even on. <laughs> no, he's on. I feel like World War II movies get a little glamorized, and I think that's why people get so intrigued with them. And I and glamorized might not be the correct word, but um, you know, you have movies like Pearl Harbor. And it's this love story and like all the, you know, it's a, uh, oh my God, what did, what did they call it? Uh, I can't remember. Somebody said like a really funny, like war romance movie, like thing or whatever. I can't remember what it is right now. Any, anything but, with Kate, Kate Beckinsale is fine for me. Yeah, but I, but I, th I think sometimes some movies get a little bit, um, glamorized and i think that's why people are so intrigued with it too as well but i also think that people relate so much because they had somebody in their family who was in the war who experienced that and they have that connection so i think that's why because it's it's one of the the farthest but closest wars um that you know i I don't do much on World War One, for example, even though I had um, my great uncle and my great great grandfather, my, my great great uncle and my great great grandfather were in World War One. So I have that relation. They were on the Canadian side. My great great grandfather, he or my great great uncle was a POW in Germany. Mm -hmm. And my great great grandfather joined uh, World War one to find his brother so yeah. like 
I, I have that connection, but it's not something that like super intrigues me, but I feel like World War II is super close to a lot of people. And so I think that's why they connect to it more, but also like, I completely forgot what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> I, it was, I, it was, it was, it was something about the starting rotation for the Boston Red Sox. <laughs> yes, it's yeah. something like I'm that. I'm just disappointed but too. I, I, th I think it was, I think it's just more of like a relation thing. Um, I don't know how younger generations look at World War II films or anything like that, but I hope that, you know, people like you keep spitting out those documentaries and, and letting us know about these people and, and what happened and everything like that, because it is really important because World War II, I mean, the Civil War and World War I too as well, but um, World War II is a really huge turning point, you know, that's, we so much had has come out of world war ii for example the the cia you know like all this all this other you know stuff and it's just um yeah i'm blabbing so no i think i think you're you're right i think there's a very strong personal connection there mm -hmm. and i also think that people want to look back on a time where everything made sense there was somebody who wore the black hat and mm -hmm. there was somebody who wore the white hat and we were fighting for our fellow man. We were fighting for democracy. We were fighting to liberate a foreign people mm -hmm. um, who had been who had been, you know, put under the boot, the hobnail boot of 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 either you know Germany or the um, Arisaka rifle of the Japanese. I think people today are so confused about everything in the world that they look for a clear time when america came together and one of the pilots we asked who was a jewish american who flew a b-17 he was shot down over belgium uh, his name was bruce Sumlin. he later became governor of uh, rhode island and was one of the starting founders of netjets i said mm -hmm. bruce can you explain what it was like during the war time give me the feel he said well i was going to help you but i knew that you were going to help me and together we were going to get the job done. So when you think about that today, th mm -hmm. is that how we are today? It's not how we are today. Not, so no. people look back in a time when America came together. We, we had some of those vibes after 9-11, obviously. Yeah. Um, young people joined the military. They wanted to get in and avenge. And, you know, God, some of the nicest people and some of the smartest and most courageous people I've met are the current generation of military. But people back on World War II are looking for that clarity mm -hmm. when we knew what we were fighting for. And that wasn't the case in Korea. That wasn't the case in, in Vietnam. Yeah. And, and then in, in latter conflicts and wars, you know, sometimes it was and sometimes it wasn't. But I think people just want to, to figure out what made America come together you know why were there seven-year-olds on bikes collecting scrap iron why were women mm. who were cooking now building tanks and planes and and why were 17 year olds volunteering to go off to the pacific and europe and fight for the freedom of people that they didn't know and yeah. um, that that fascinates a lot of people and there were just on the american side there were 16 million who served and each one of those 16 million had their own personal story from world war ii they could write their own book or be in their own documentary mm -hmm. and I mean, it's incredible when you hear these stories they keep coming out and that's why i think documentaries and feature films like oppenheimer and and greyhound which tom hanks did a great job in mm -hmm. greyhound on, on apple tv uh, about the, the the escorts across the north atlantic yeah uh, People want to know more about these times and these situations and these people. And I, th yeah. I th think that's fascinating. I think all the people from that, you know, we've been back to Auschwitz with an Auschwitz survivor. And, you know, he was there and his job every day was to go around the camp and empty the waste. So he went to every part of the camp. When we got him to go back to Auschwitz, we just put a microphone on him and said, Izzy, take us around the camp. Tell us what you saw. And it was like, that's all we had to do. Yeah. And then we followed him around Auschwitz for four hours. And it was like this living history lesson. You're just jaw drops that one person saw all this or survived all this. Um, but it, it's really like he witnessed this part of history. He witnessed the Holocaust at Auschwitz. And he's in one of our films talking yeah. about it so it doesn't happen again. And there are millions of stories out there and a lot of people who are watching tonight or who, who love your, your Instagram page and everything else had some kind of connection to somebody like your Opa, you know, in the family.
who maybe they knew the story or maybe they didn't know the story. Most of the time they didn't know the story. Yeah. Until they pass away and you go up in the attic and you find a, a, a silver star and a bronze star mm -hmm. and a distinguished service cross or a Navy cross, or you found something up there that says, holy crap, grandpa landed on the easy red sector of Omaha Beach on D-Day and for 80 years, he didn't say anything about yeah. it. How, how yeah. come? That I, amazing, it, men are it, amazing. It, it, it it is and and you think about the kind of i guess innocent world that we live in nowadays and you hear those stories and you know history and you hear those stories about somebody landing on omaha or utah or uh, you know parachuting in market garden or you know storming guadalcanal and you hear like these awful stories and you, and you have you're like oh my god my uncle did that my grandpa did that my neighbor did that yeah. like it's it's kind of surreal you can't like really imagine it like th thinking that it actually happened but it but it did and so i think that also intrigues people a lot too as well and, yeah. and, and then you know with with someone mentioned saving private ryan earlier um and obviously that that effect and the band of brothers effect and the pacific effect mm -hmm. i thought they did an awesome job on the pacific relating what it was like to fight on those islands um, yeah. we were we were just on iwo jima probably about four months ago it was the end of march mm -hmm. and we were standing down by the water in that sand and when you get off the the landing craft in iwo jima the first thing you do is sink into the sand because it's volcanic sand yeah. You know, and you get a feeling, okay, I'm standing here, my cameraman's standing here. I didn't have 70 pounds of stuff on my on my back, like yeah. the, the 5th Marines or the 4th Marines did, mm -hmm. for each division did back in 1945. So you get that sense of place that I talked about earlier and say, I don't know how anyone survived this. And how could they not be affected the rest of their lives? Yeah, it's, it's, it's absolutely. The Pacific. I'm. I'm not saying one theater was. Um, oh, you can say more, it more. More gnarly than. The oh other. no, you can each, say each, it. Each of them had their own, but the Pacific was a. Bad. It, bad. it was bad. You were secluded on an island, like you. It, it's, and and that's the thing. Like a lot of people who are fans of Band of Brothers and the Pacific, um, they compare Band of Brothers. To yeah. Pacific, and you can't do that because they are completely different. Even though they're from Stephen Ambrose and Tom Hanks, and they're along the same kind of lines, but there are two completely different stories. And that's also what's going to mm -hmm. happen with with Masters of the Air too. People are going to compare Masters of the Air to that's, that's and, yeah. and, and and that's natural. It's totally natural because I I know I did it. I did it with the Pacific originally, and it took me a while to actually like watch the Pacific and get yep. through it. And now yep. it's like. I absolutely love it. Mm -hmm. um, and they're going to do the same thing with Masters there, but also making a bomber movie is, is really hard because, um, like, dude, I'm very interested to see what, how Masters of the Air plays out yeah. because, yeah. Um, you know, you think of, uh, what is it, 12 o'clock high? Yeah. Uh, yeah, 12 o'clock high. high and, and you think, like, it's just up in the air, on the ground, up in the air, on the ground, and you're like, how can you make this more... Even though I love them, sure, I'm sure know? for three hundred million dollars, they will find a way. Yeah, I, I'm sure they will. But the thing is, like, when with Band of Brothers, like you, you have that you know camaraderie and of, yeah. of following Easy Company in uh, the European theater and and you know what they did, and then you have the Pacific, which you are following, you know, three different three different divisions and and you know all these stories, but you see the you see battle in band of brothers and like the gnarliness of it but in the pacific you see like the raw like it was completely different than the european theater like completely different and you see more of just like what war was like i think and i think war as you you mentioned raw and I think the Pacific did such a great job in conveying that they were two separate wars, okay? You're mm -hmm. fighting two separate, you're fighting some guys in Europe who are going by the Geneva Convention. Yeah. And then you're fighting the Pacific and you're fighting the Japanese who never ratified the Geneva Convention when yeah. it came to the treatment of prisoners. Mm -hmm. So you've got guys with the Bushido Code, the Japanese, who are going to die for the emperor and they're and they're going to take you, the American Marine, with them. 
or if they do capture you, they are not going to abide by the Geneva Convention and they're going to torture you. Mm -hmm. They're going to bayonet you. They're going to bring you to the Philippines, the Cabanatuan or Camp O'Donnell, mm -hmm. and they're going to starve you to death or you're going to die of disease. The Pacific was so good in conveying the environment in which they so fought. Good war the jungles the someone mentioned crocodiles yes the crocodiles the malaria the dysentery the fanatical enemy mm -hmm. um and, mm -hmm. and, and and as different as band and brothers and the pacific war the pacific war was that different than the european war so i thought when, yeah. I, thought, when I watched the um pacific that first time I thought, hmm. And, but when I watched it again, I'm like, I see exactly what they're doing. They yeah. can't follow one group through the entire thing. You can't. You can't, no. but, but they did a good story. But more than anything, they conveyed, even at the end of the Pacific, when Leckie came home and wanted to pay for his, his cab fare, mm -hmm. and the driver said, I may have jumped into Normandy on D-Day, but you know, you guys have got no leave. You didn't get to meet any women over there in the Pacific. You were dealing with much more than even we dealt with on D-Day. And for, for the cabbie to say that to him kind of summed up the whole series for me. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, it, I mean, it does. Like they, they couldn't go on leave. They were on a, a three mile island. <laughs> you know, like they, Where are they gonna they, go to the bar? They, they, the tiki, yeah, the tiki hut? They're gonna they have go, mimosas at the yeah. tiki hut? No, <laughs> they're, they're not gonna do that. There's no such thing as leave. And so it just, it was a, it, it was a very different war. And obviously you're fighting a, a different enemy because you have the European theater and you're fighting, you know, Hitler and the Nazis. And then you have the Pacific and you're fighting the Japanese. And so it's, it's two, even though they were allies, it's two completely different yeah. tactics and, and everything. It's yeah. just, it's, um, so people need to take like you know Band of Brothers and Pacific. Yeah, they need absolutely. to realize like absolutely. the Pacific and, is the Pacific. Like yeah, the and, actors and, and were Band great. Of the European, oh, amazing. The amazing. Actors were great. Yeah. I mean, you know, everybody in that series, you know, um, John Sedas has been supportive of our foundation, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. Scott Gibson, and and a bunch of those guys. And the same with the Band of Brothers. But you know what was really interesting, and you know Freddie's been typing, and he mentioned the Great Raid as well, mm -hmm. um, which was another you know based on the book, which was another amazing yeah. and very and very true story at Cabana Tuan. Mm -hmm. um, but but you know it's just it's amazing what the actors have done over these years since 2001 when Band of Brothers came out, and how they've become the face of all these veterans who passed away. Yeah, you know, no more people will know what John, that John Bassalon looks more like John Seda um, than John, you know, than Bassalon looked like himself because that's just you know we've gone through this now and it's the same for the Band of Brothers guys. Frank John Hughes is Bill Garnier. Yeah. So when you see a picture of Frank John Hughes um, who's portraying you know Bill Garnier, younger people will be like, oh my God, that's Bill Garnier. It's like no, that's Frank John Hughes, Hughes who did such a great job playing Bill Garnier yeah. that that now you're kind of focused on. Bill's story now. And I think mm -hmm. all the actors who have been in both series have done such a great job in, in every one of them. And Freddie, Freddie will tell you this, that it wasn't just a role for them. When you put no, that role was, with your uniform yeah. on, it's like, I have to get this right. Um, we have to honor these men in the proper way. This isn't a regular TV series. This isn't McHale's Navy or Hogan's Heroes. This is the real deal based on real people. Yeah, a, a year ago, um, I was at the, well, on the 13th, but I landed in New Orleans. A year ago, I went to the, the Band of Brothers yep. Symposium at the National World War II Museum, and they had a round table, and they had all veterans and active military people at this um, round table, and um, it, it was, it was, it was in, not insane, but it was so heartwarming to hear these veterans and active military members who talked about how, how much Band of Brothers meant to them and about what the actor or that character meant to them yeah. or and, and that person in real life meant to them. And, and you, I would hear these people um, in this saying, you know, I joined the military because of Band of Brothers and after September mm -hmm. 11th and all that yeah. stuff, I wanted to be yeah. in the Airborne. And you hear, and the, the stories that and the thanks and all the stuff that these guys were saying. It's amazing. It, it was absolutely, it was like the most heartwarming thing. And it's crazy that, you know, something like Band of Brothers and the Pacific and Saving Private Ryan and these things have such an effect on people. And yeah. it's like, and, and the thing is like, you know, I had the honor of meeting 
you know, some of the actors in, in Band of Brothers and yes. they, and they really take that, that character, you know, that person that they portrayed yeah. to heart. And even if that person wasn't alive mm -hmm. when, when Band of Brothers was filmed, like they went out of their way to make sure that they got it correct. They t spoke to the family. They yeah. want to be like, did, did your uncle or dad do this? Yeah. Like, is this correct? You know, they really wanted to portray yeah. those those men exactly how they wanted to and uh, they did and, you know and, and, and they did and sometimes you know we've we've we had an event in providence jimmy Matteo came in and ross mccall and we had a couple of the living um um al mampri was there and i think maybe um there were a couple others who were there babe heffron and bill were there mm -hmm. at the time and we had a hundred current 101st airborne um soldier in the crowd and he at the question at the end he said I, I don't want i don't have a question but i just want to tell you guys that when we were in afghanistan we're in the middle of a, a sandstorm and we're in our tent and we're watching band of brothers and that brought our morale up so much and motivated us so much mm -hmm. and i looked at babe heffron's face and you could see like in babe's eyes like he couldn't believe that a current paratrooper who was serving in afghanistan they're all around a small TV in the middle of a sandstorm in the desert and they're watching Band of Brothers and they're being motivated by it. And I saw Babe go up and talk to him after and, and watching that generation talk to this generation, there's a bond there I will never understand because yeah. obviously, um, but to watch that generation talk with that mm -hmm. other generation, they're both the same. They're in certain, they're in different cir circumstances and it's a, they're much younger, but boy, they're both the same. Yeah, different concepts different ages but it's it, there is something that is that unites them um there's just something there <laughs> so, yeah. yeah yeah no there is i don't know if anybody has any questions or anything like that or i owe anybody money that that they're gonna remind <laughs> Do you of. Owe anybody money? <laughs> i wonder yeah. i wonder if Are like matt leach is still on if matt leach is still on he's probably gonna ask me some dumb question about something that i'm gonna end up owing him five euros do you know what he's it's like what time is it? oh it's it's five twenty one. it's like three o'clock in the morning where he is i, I never know where he is I don't, though, so I don't you think never he, you know i don't think he's on know. anymore okay good <laughs> i gave him Woo. i gave him i gave him a hard time last night he was on the we happy few page i'm i help out with the we happy few page and yeah. uh, he was he was like posting stuff and i was like go to bed <laughs> like yeah. it's like it's like four o'clock in the morning go to bed and he's like yeah, put the coffee <laughs> put the coffee down and go to bed Matt. oh my god yeah yeah so. now he's, he's a great guy all oh, the actors have been yeah. super and and um you know it's it's just nice to talk with them and they, they can't do enough when it comes to honoring that generation mm -hmm. so we've had a lot of guys over the years who could have easily said no um but because the ask was you know can you come back to normandy for the 75th anniversary or 70th anniversary you know damian lewis appears you know at nine o'clock in the morning at a statue you know ceremony and we're like okay this is cool yeah um, but yeah i mean they're it's they'll all tell you it was different from any other role that they've ever had and they will carry mm -hmm. that with them the rest of their lives um yeah. it's, such, it's more than just acting it's it's a very special it's a special bond and, yeah. and i you know actors who i mean obviously i'm not an actor but i i feel like actors who portray like a, a real life you know veteran hero or somebody in history or you know a real person it, you kind of connect to that role and it really like yeah. you know latches with you yeah because, yeah, you be because you become because you become that person like yeah you have to, you have to. in order to play the role dale so die, to know, yeah. dale die is making sure physically and mentally that you become that person so dale yeah. you know with the boot camps with the boot camps that dale ran for band of brothers and saving private ryan and also the pacific you know dale whipped those guys in the shape and and and, and had them ready to you know play those roles and a lot of credit goes to dale as much as you know nobody liked what you know um you know having to do all those push-ups and sit-ups and 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 all the other things dale dale's contribution to all those you know films and series is heavy and um it's been great getting to know someone like him who was a you know a vietnam hero and and um things like that so mm -hmm. but yeah um someone made a comment earlier about me owing the money so i don't know if matt came back on but, but <laughs> no. I'm, I'm oh, wait, hold on. 
Somebody asked about our our favorite place to go, and I would have to. Say. It's 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 Freddie. Freddie wants to oh, know what's good. your favorite place in history. Uh, <laughs> what's your favorite place in history to visit? And you probably owe me money. Yeah, probably somewhere along the line. I'm sure I owe everybody who's yeah. been to a reunion money. Um, probably Normandy. Um, we've been about 17 or 18 times now to film in Normandy. So Normandy and Pearl Harbor are two places that we spend a lot of time. Um, but lately, we've also been in Italy a lot, which is incredible. Um, um, there are some islands out in the Pacific that we've been to. I've been to Peleliu a couple of times mm -hmm. and filmed there, mm -hmm. which is haunting. Almost Peleliu, um, if you saw, they devoted three episodes in the Pacific to just yeah. Peleliu. Yeah. So you know how bad of a fight that was. But to go to that island and, and spend time there, uh, it was as haunting for me as going to Auschwitz because of what happened to the Marines there and yeah. the environment in which they fought on Peleliu. It was nothing mm -hmm. you know, like it was on Guadalcanal when they, when they began in August of 1942. Mm -hmm. So um, Peleliu, Normandy, um, are two places. Um, Pearl Harbor, for obvious reasons, just because that's where it all began for the United States. Yeah. Um, cabinet war rooms in London to go down there and visit where Churchill and, and everyone, you know, they're planning the war down there. Mm -hmm. um, we've just been to so many places that it's the history still resonates because of the bullet marks on the columns yeah. or what was left behind. We go in, there were 500 caves on Peleliu and you go in there and you find things in there like the battle ended the day before. You know, Japanese helmets, radios, samurai swords, bullets, medical dressings. Um, so when you step back in time like that, um, that's something I always find incredible. And, and honestly, I think the best part of what I've done the last 18 years is just the people that we've met and become friends with. Mm -hmm. I mean, I never would have met all of these people and made so many friends across the world without being interested in World War II. And, and mm -hmm. everyone has helped us and everyone has just gone above and beyond to make sure the films are accurate and that we have what we need when we're filming overseas or, or make sure we get the facts right. I mean, we just, you know, it's like anything else. It's, you surround yourself with good people who make you look good. And that's what we've done. You know, I've, yeah. I've got great, I've got great uh, videographers who work with me and great audio people and composers and researchers in France and people who do history like you and everybody else. It's just like we're a community. You know, we are a community. Mm -hmm. We're trying to preserve mm -hmm. something that happened 80 years ago that, that maybe other people people aren't interested in but here i'm going to tell you why you should be interested yeah exactly. and that's what we all do online some mm -hmm. are more technical than others um in terms of you know this my 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 big thing over here is i'm going to do the strategy of the war i'm like that's perfect i'm mm -hmm. going to do the important dates of the war i'm like that's perfect i'm going to do the then and now of the war i'm like that's perfect you know i'm going to do what i do you do what you do but we're all a part of this community of trying to keep that generation's lessons and message and everything else a lot. Yeah, we, we want to share it and we want to tell people and people don't know that they're interested in it until they read it or see it. Yeah, or and see I it. Abs and I absolutely love when I see um, the museum posting and you guys have the high school days and you, yeah. they're all on the VRs and they're just like, yeah. you know, so immersed and I'm like that is so cool to see these 16 17 year olds yeah. like super intrigued by that because you don't see that nowadays and no. and and kids and you know kids nowadays don't know it until they actually like see it yeah so why it's, it's it's super important to keep these museums open to keep uh sharing history content to you know like just keep keeping history alive pretty much it's that, like, that's the pretty much thing. it yeah yeah is, pour it out there and see who's interested and we have a lot of kids who come in who are eight or nine years old and i'm like wow you're interested in this and they're like yeah i love this stuff i'm like wow yeah. that's so cool and tell me why you're interested in it so, i was i was at the oregon military museum uh like it was like a year ago and they have a bunch of of uh korean war and vietnam tanks up in front and there were like these seven and eight year old kids and i was seriously my mouth was my jaw dropped to the floor because these kids were running around the tanks being like this is this this is this, this, this and like just like spitting out information yeah. and i'm like what <laughs> how do you know all this i'm like how do you know all this and they're like yeah oh my god this is the truth and like and i was just like and it just my mouth was to the floor but also i was like so like i was like this is so amazing <laughs> I'm so you know, proud you know of how kids. they you know how they know call of duty um, video game yeah. no seriously no, no seriously because we'll we'll yeah. have we'll have kids into the museum and i'll ask them first question i go someone 
um, anybody here ever here in Normandy? And the hands will go up, the boys mostly. And I'll say, anyone ever here in Omaha Beach? And hands will go up. And I'll say, how do you know these names? And they're like, Call of Duty. And their teacher will be like, kind of embarrassed. And I'm like, no. I go, this no, is great. It's, it's awesome. I'm actually happy that a video game is teaching kids history. <laughs> it, it at least gets the it. names He's, out there. Exactly. It at least gets yeah. Normandy, Omaha. And then let me introduce you to a real veteran who landed on Omaha Beach. And let's hear his story now. Yeah, at least, they know, like, at least yeah. they know the names. Yeah, so. exactly. No, I completely, I completely agree. Oh, wow. Oh. Oh my gosh, Tim, it's been an hour and a half. We yeah, have had such a conversation. No. Thank <laughs> you so much. I've absolutely enjoyed it. Thank you so much for well, coming on History Behind the Page and joining us and, and just chatting with us. It's so great to hear yeah. your backstory and like everything. And um, yeah, so. <laughs> now, listen, all of, your, all of your people who are on tonight and, and, and checking in, some I know and some I don't know, but they're all very passionate about that time period. And it's important that, you know, you follow your passion and yeah. their passion might be, their passion might be, you know, that 1939 to 1945, that, that's great. Mm -hmm. Follow your passion. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Tim, thank you absolutely You're welcome, so much Sarah. for coming on. So yeah, it's a pleasure <laughs> to talk to you in person. Yeah, I know. It's so great. So, yeah. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Well, thank you, yeah, Fred. Thank you, Freddie. Yeah. Thanks, guys, for tuning in. You guys can follow Tim at uh, Tim Green 1944. It's also uh, International World War II Museum and the World War II Foundation. Um, you can follow him on Instagram and Facebook. But Tim, thank you so much. Thank you. Let's talk again soon. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Bye, Sarah.